Next up is Lee Witherell, he's Managing Director of Community's Data Intelligence, um, headquartered in Leeds, but uh, Lee was in uh, London. He's going to be talking to you about C Suite, so how to get from all the data, the actual insight that actually has an impact and an influence of decision making. Thanks, thank you, Dan. Uh, I hope you're enjoying this afternoon's session. I hope you think sort of the momentum goes quite a warm afternoon. I'm glad that Dan made the point that I'm actually the managing director of data intelligence because if it got back to my real boss that he said I was managing director of Communisys, which is a very, very much larger group, then I might get a bit of a kicking. Uh, although I would like to be on Andy Blundell's salary, that's my, my big boss. Uh, there is a point to that though because we are the data intelligence part of a much larger uh, print, business process outsourcing, digital business and, and that actually is the context behind what I'm talking to you about this afternoon because quite often we are going into pitches or we are talking to existing clients about future work or expanding the scope of work and what we do with them and we are not just talking about the data arm or the people that we're talking to are not just interested in data or the, the way that we traditionally look at data but they are looking at a number of areas across it could be finance operation, HR, and invariably, if not myself, someone in our organization is talking to someone at quite the senior level because the buying decisions are wrapped up to um, sort of the tens of millions of pounds in terms of, of revenue and margin to us, and obviously CapEx and OpEx expenditure for our clients. So, with that in mind, I just want to check, does everyone know what I mean when I say the C-suite? It's not a euphemism for anything nasty. It actually means the uh, anyone with a C in their title, so chief. So CFO, chief finance officer, CEO, a chief executive officer, a CTO, chief technology officer, increasingly the CIO, the chief information officer. Um, and it's because, I try to make the point that we're moving away from talking only to CMOs, so chief marketing officers, or people at the sort of the CRM manager or director or marketing manager or director. We now find that we're talking to people across a wide range of disciplines. And what I'm hoping to give you this afternoon is just a few ideas, and perhaps a toolkit, of the way to pitch the data and the analytics proposition to them. Um, because we're all highly numerate and we're all highly intelligent, we work in data, I want to do a little straw poll and do a little bit of segmentation. Can, if you work with, or if you have access, or if you present what you do, or have buy-in from people in what we would term the C-suite, so I mean very senior executives, can you stick your hand up? So it's, it's a few of you. So can you stick them up a bit higher, sorry? There's a reason for this. So it's a few of you, but not everyone, that's what we find. Keep them up. Can you then, if you work for a client organization, so those people are people in your organization. Can you put your hands down? Okay, that robs you a few of you. So that means the rest of you are all working for agencies or marketing services providers or data consultancies and you're trying to get to these people within client organizations. Is that, is that correct? So that the point I'm making there is that this type of conversation is relevant to people whether they're on, on the client side or they're on the agency side. Uh, and I'll give you an example of that, and I, I turned up late, apologies to Dan, uh, I didn't see the first few speakers. Because I was at a client meeting earlier on today, where our client was having to actually consider what we're talking about here. The client was having, in next week in fact, the end of next week, needs to make a presentation to their own board, talking about the benefits of, it's quite a mundane subject, benefits of customer journey analysis, data cleansing, and building a single customer view database. So it's not rocket science compared to what we were sort of hearing from Joe about using Python and the do and analyze, you know, the, the sexy stuff. But actually it's quite a big monetary decision for that organization to make. Um, and it will involve presenting and selling their case, <coughs> even within their own organization, to their board. So hopefully some of what we're gonna talk about here has some relevance to those situations. I'll let you read that. This 
is typically the way that I think we, as we assume or have assumed in the past very senior people look at data and databases. And actually, to a great degree, they do. In the past, certainly, I worked for senior people who did not have computers on their desk, wouldn't know what to do with a laptop if you gave it to them. The database was something dirty that did with IT, and they didn't really want to know about it, unless it was going wrong and costing them lots of money in support terms. Now, that has changed, and it is changing. They are realizing the value of this and what we do as an asset to them. It doesn't mean it's easy to sometimes communicate to them because they are always looking at the bottom line, but they do realize now just how important it is. And one of the reasons that that's, uh, that's come up is the use of the term big data, and I'll, I'll come back to this in a moment. Uh, this, isn't, this isn't selfish, but just to put it in context. So this, this is what we are, what we do. And it's actually the top bit isn't that much interest, it's the bottom bit that makes it important. We crunch a lot of data for our clients. That therefore means that they are spending a fairly significant amount with us to do that, either within my division or across the group. Therefore, the decisions that are being made there are of such significance that someone seeing it is now being involved. And that's, that's moved on. So if you look at, you know, I guess what a lot of speakers are talking about, the projects that we do for our clients are becoming increasingly important and recognised at board level. And in terms of what we what we do do, and I think this is what all of us are trying to do. We're trying to do, we're trying to sort of go through this data trail, which is first off, <coughs> take all that information that's being generated, either intentionally or unintentionally, and turn it into intelligence. So crunching numbers, analysing data in and of itself is of limited value unless you derive some intelligence from it. And a great example of that is we do lots of work now. Uh, with online gaming companies. We do lots of work now with uh, utilities who are driving their customers to transact online. We do lots of work now with mobile <coughs> telephone companies. And all the data that's generated there is actually almost what you might term a digital exhaust. It's being pushed out the back just as a circumstance of business being done. No one is saying, go out and build a database for me. This is just being generated in the way that they transact with their customers. The thing that you then see, or the, the, the areas you then see as you start to turn that intelligence into action, so to run a campaign, build a database, capture more data, and then turn it into optimization, so actually driving campaign, marketing program performance, business performance improvement. That's where your sim suite people get very excited, because they will look at using data and analytics as a way of taking either let's say a 10 million pound cost of running a marketing operation and reducing that by 20%, saving yourself two million pounds a year, that's a big tip for them. Or taking that same 10 million pounds as an investment which currently, let's say, generates an ROI of five to one and improving that into an ROI of 10 to one. They are the numbers that they are interested in. And I, I mentioned this before, and I'll, I'll let you read that, but um, the reason I've, got, I've, I've mentioned big data is because big data is a buzzword, and it, get, it cuts through and gets resonance with people in the C-suite. Um, I'll let you read that briefly. The point I'm making here is that everyone in an organization at a senior level should, if they don't, they should, have an interest in what data, the database, and analytics can do for them. And there are a number of examples there. And this is actually, I would say, some of this is aspirational, and you will hear people talk about it, because there are a lot of instances where your HR director, particularly if the business is, is relatively small, is not that interested in data. But I have worked with organizations where they are starting to actually look, and this is very pertinent to the audience we've got and the subject of this afternoon's session, and also very pertinent to what Dan does for a business, that they will look at analyzing stats across their organization of qualifications that people came in with, where they were recruited from. So it's very much like the sports arena, and then predicting how, you know, how these people will move through an organization. Will they leave you after 18 months to two years, after you've given them a lot of training and invested a lot of money in? Now that is an issue 
especially when you've got people at a relatively senior level leaving you, because the cost of recruiting them is quite high, the cost of them going is quite high, because they'll go to a competitor, you've then got to incur recruitment fees to go and find someone else. You also have that opportunity cost, because while they're not in the business, so you've got them on three months gardening leave, and then another three months to go and find someone else to recruit them, that is all costing you money. Now, you might think, well, what, you know, where does data come into that? Well, you will have, there will be data, there will be numbers and data there that you can crunch, and you can present back to an HR director and say, if you look at it statistically, if you have enough data points, if you look at where we've recruited people from, be it the universe they come from, competitive companies they come from, if you look at the qualifications they have, plus the training we've given them, and some other factors like the division they're in and what they do, and also some, let's say, in-program, using marketing to, uh, stats such as what grades they get or what scores they've got whenever they're assessed by HR people, you might be able to predict if someone's going to leave you. So you start to turn, you start to turn classic terms like retention and churn modeling and take them from the marketing arena into the HR arena. So you can see, it's just an example to see for everyone in the C-suite, data and analysis is becoming important. What I'm going to talk about now is how you might present this to that type of audience in language that they understand and in a way that really resonates with them and will get by it. And I'm going to use a, it's a lot of triangles, either sort of pyramids, either that way or that way, because it sort of gets it across quite easy. But the way that senior execs think is they don't think data up, they think value drivers down. So they will think, if I'm looking at the share price of my company, I am looking at the revenue and the margin of my company. That's a value driver. What levers are changing that? So for instance, you might be the value driver, oh, sorry, I'll just continue that metaphor. If you, if, and then what KPIs do you look at, do you measure, to see how well you're doing in turning those dials and managing those levers? And then underneath all that is what data drives that. Give an example. If you look at uh, in, I suppose mobile telephony, things like companies like O2, Vodafone, uh, EE will look at ARPA, so average revenue per user, and that might be the value driver. So they're looking at overall our uh, overall aggregated ARPA for a company. The levers of that might be customer acquisition or customer retention. So more customers you get in, that's great. The less customers that leave you, even better. KPIs would be your retention rate or your customer acquisition rate for you from your competition. Where data has a real part to play is both in actually running the campaigns so you can target people using data, but also having the data available to measure the effectiveness of your marketing program. So if we if we go a little bit management consultancy and use terminology that uh, someone like Accenture would use, but would, would again would use with senior execs. They might go in and rather than saying, how do you make money, they'll, they'll use terminology so like, how do you get increased shareholder value from exploiting the digital journey? And I'll explain what that means for people like us. Uh, and there, there could be three ways. It could be revenue growth, so you actually just sell more. Increased operating margin, you sell more or the same, but it costs you less to sell. Better asset exploitation. You are using your kit, your infrastructure, your machinery, and your people in a better way. So how does data analytics play a part in that? So the way that the way this is actually, this is my view, and this is where I think we go slightly wrong as data professionals and analysts. In that our typical, and I've done this, I've done this throughout my career, our typical sales pitch to anyone at any level, but even at the senior level. We go straight in and we talk about, we can do some analysis for you, we can crunch your numbers, and we can tell you which are the most effective channels for you. That's one project. We'll also, we might look at how you improve cross sell and upsell. So we'll do some modeling and look at customer value management throughout the, uh, throughout the program. Uh, we might look at particularly on subscription services, or let's say within quad play in the, in the mobile telephony and uh, sort of media industry will look at what bundles or what can you offer your clients, so next best action, next best product type of things. Your 
audience that are interested in mode color databases don't get that. That to them is too much detail, you're talking specifics. They'll get there eventually, but you've only got a limited time to sell them. So that is actually what you're going to end up doing. But what they're really interested in is the next step. So, okay, if you start to talk to them about we need a custom development program, a program that costs an upsell and in retention or uh, all customer loyalty program, they're starting to buy it. And what they really buy now is think like this. I will come in and I will show you how to retain and grow your customer base and how to acquire more customers. And the result of that, Mr. CFO, CTO, CMO, is that you will see revenue growth. Does that make sense? Because that's what they buy. Therefore, what you need to do is you need to take that triangle and flip it. So when you go in to speak to them, and this isn't going to work for everyone because some of them, and you might find that as people become more data literate, they actually get the detail. But at the moment, I think you'll find most of them want the overview. If you come in and talk to them about, okay, in a more sort of management consultancy way, your issue is revenue, or your issue is actually improving operating margin. How do you do that? You can do that through a volume strategy, so get more customers, increase your penetration, win business from your competition, or start a new, you know, create a new segment within the marketplace or a new category. Or you can do, or as or, you can do it through intelligent pricing strategies. So you can actually undercut your competition with business, or you can offer added value, which means you can leverage a premium pricing approach. Excuse me. And then you can talk about the way that you do that is programmatic. Acquire new customers, customer retention, uh, pricing to find demand management. So actually, with some things like even with Uber, you'll pay more when there's more demand for it, you'll pay less when uh, most people aren't traveling. And also price optimization. So again, similar thing. If you look at a lot of airlines, a lot of train companies, they will offer you better prices when they know they don't have capacity. When they do have over capacity, you'll pay more. So you think about So what you end up with is that original triangle but reversed. So you go all the way through here. So why you should be talking to us, Mr. C-suite person? And I'm going to talk to you about how data management can help you what those programs would look like, how you might break it down operationally within your organization, and then you talk to them about individual uh, bundles of data and you know, analytics compositions. Now, the way, what we're finding is if you do it that way, you're actually selling more of these because they see it as a package. So whereas before you'd go in and think, oh, we did well in that settlement, we came out selling them uh, the ability to do cross-sell and upsell campaigns. Really, we're now finding well, they're looking at that, but they're but they're greedy. They want you, they want to actually make as much money as possible. The problem with guys are both of them, so they're interested in more. And you can also use. I won't go through this one because I know uh, we're going to catch up in a little bit of time. But you can also use it. So you can use it in the traditional sense for things like acquiring customers. But you can look at things like operating margin, things that would actually, it's interesting, things that are more related to operational research, so how you best use your assets, how you best use your infrastructure, which is actually where a lot of people came into st statistics originally, it was around things like looking at, you know, if I've got X people in this warehouse, X people in this, uh, X products in this warehouse, how do I get it together more quickly? And those are the types of things that you still get a lot of senior execs interested in. So just moving on from that, uh, we'll talk about KPIs. What, and again, this is a, a, a part where data and analytics has a, an increasing part to play. So we're finding that a lot of people we're talking to, whereas traditionally we'd be talking about talking to them about direct marketing campaigns, or possibly edging into ECR or social media, they're now saying to us, okay, I need to know how everything I'm doing above the line, below the line, how we're being talked about in the media, how is that impacting on, in this instance, sales revenue, but it could be, how is it impacting on my net promoter score? Uh, and what you always have to 
you think about with the, the guy or the girl that you're sitting opposite who's that senior in tech is what are they being measured on? So if they are being measured on sales, that's what you need to look at analyzing and looking at the drivers that drive that. So we typically tend to break things down and analyze. It's almost like a, like a light form of econometrics, although we're not a media agency, so we don't try and go up against them in that respect. But we try and break it down in terms of your reach. So you know, how much media spend are they uh, spending and by which channels, consideration. So this is usually picked up by a survey. So what are people thinking about their products in comparison to their uh, competitors? What's being said about that product or service in rate, online ratings and reviews? Uh, certainly there are a lot of surveys out there, Syndicate Services will, will actually ask the question, would you consider buying this product from this company or from another company? That will get used in this time now. And then you've got, and that's a little bit soft for us, because a lot of that's based on surveys, it's not quite as quantifiable, it's not quite as quantitative. Once you get down to here, you are getting into numbers, things that we can play with. So you can look, within engagement, you can look at uh, who's this the website, how long they're, they're dwelling on particular pages, where you're dropping them off, you've got a proper funnel analysis there. We're also looking at uh, sort of calls into call centers, use of uh, you know online web chat, use of, of, so, of, use of social media as a, as a customer service technique, and then online applications of actually all, you know, in branch sales as well. And a lot of that is using a lot of the techniques I think Joe was, was sort of referring to as well, because we're looking at things like sentiment analysis, text mining, we're looking at dragging out that type of information, or almost unstructured information that would, would be sort of beyond what we did analytically a while back. And then finally, you know, in terms of the hard measures, we're looking at things like just how much sales are you achieving, what is the margin of the sale, and is that tracking against what their expectation and what their forecast and what they're putting back to the city. And in terms of another, another nice output of that for us, another nice deliverable we do like to put in front of them is, is dashboards. So dashboarding and visualization is actually really important for this type of audience because they don't crunch numbers themselves. They find it hard to understand trend charts in many ways, but they are used to looking at what we call detailed trend charts. But they are used to looking at things that just tell them very quickly what the delta is in a situation. So, and do I see more generate, more revenue being generated because my customers are buying more of my products, bundling it up? Am I seeing an improvement in operating margin because more of my customers are self-serving by going online rather than calling my call centre and therefore I can actually downsize in terms of call centre staff or branch staff? And am I seeing a better asset exploitation so I don't have that much stock tied up just sitting in warehouses not being sold? But go below that in detail and you start to lose it. Um, final couple of slides from me, and, and this is just a, a point, and going back to what you said earlier on in terms of the range of people you're talking to at the senior exec level, you are now seeing that the consumer is driving their own customer journey. They are driving their own experience. They are, through the increased use of self-serve online, through social media marketing, they are, they are pulling down the information they require to make a purchase decision and then ultimately make that purchase rather than you pushing to them. So that's why we see that the effectiveness of traditional DM and e e CRM, so DM campaign, email campaign, is falling away and it's actually it's not falling away, it's getting harder to make those traditional methods work. What that means is that we're using data beyond selling. So now it's much more about customer experience and you'll hear agencies in particular talk a lot about that. And this again has resonance with people in the C-suite. So again I'll let you um, I'll let you read this one because this is the, the customer experience piece is all about valuing the data asset and actually making sure that as you go through the customer journey, you're seeing improvements in the way that people interact with you. So higher contact rates, less wastage. And you can actually measure this and you can actually set benchmarks and so make sure that you're improving this year on year. I'll come back to the point about data quality uh, in a minute. Point about how 
sort of being the customer driving their own customer journey. And the way, the way that we typify this is, if you think traditionally from agency or data consulting point of view, this is the customer journey as we see it. We are making you aware of the product, we are then acquiring you, we are then onboarding you, and then we're cross-selling you different products and services to increase value, and then we're retaining you, we're trying to retain you, like generating some form of loyalty. And all the way through that, we're hoping that you become advocates for our product. In reality, and this is what a lot of agencies forget, is that the, the customer doesn't see that at all, doesn't get that. So in the, in the case of, uh, this is an example from, uh, from the automotive industry, really they just think, I need a car. I need a car, I'll do a bit of search, you know, research into it, I'll ask a few friends, I'll go online, see if people are blogging about a particular make of the car, they'll go online and look at the, uh, setting up, you know, using the car configurator on the automotive manufacturer's website, they go for a test drive, and they'll go all the way through different touch points. Really, all they're looking to do is buy the car from you. They don't see any of this. So you have to increasingly take that into account and make sure that they're not just your push messaging is going out the way you want it to. So are you sending them a nice email on a regular frequency, which fits in with your marketing department's objectives? But is the customer getting the right experience? And how can we use data to help that? So it might be that you're picking up things such as, you know, they're actually, they might be blogging about their experience with the car. They might be writing an online review. We need to be able to pick that up and pull that into the way that we deal with them moving forward. And this is actually why it's important, because customer experience will be pretty much what discriminates and differentiates between one organisation winning and another winning. Um, because if you think about it, there are a lot of sectors where even the brand differentiation doesn't count for much, but certainly the product and pricing differentiation doesn't count for much. So if you think about general insurance, it's all pretty much bought on price now. If it's car insurance, it's mandatory, you have to have it. If it's home insurance, you pretty much need to, but it's just not quite legal. But you couldn't really differentiate between the brand. It's about how you experience that brand in terms of when you, let's say you need to make a claim. Uh, mobile telephony, again, they're all offering pretty much the same deals. It could be quite confusing. They're all offering sort of pod place, so they're throwing in uh, sort of video bundles, data. Again, what differentiates them? There will be a little bit of brand space. So some people will actually like the O2 B more dog commercial. But what really differentiates them is the customer service and the customer experience. And a lot of that will boil down to the product. So if you get outage via a particular mobile phone company, you're unlikely to want to renew with them when you subscription stuff at the end of the year or 18 months. But a lot of it is down to how they handle your complaints or they handle your their inbound communications to you. And that should very much be driven by data. Um, and that is important again because at C suite, that won't necessarily be a marketeer, a CMO looking. That, that might be the head of internal operations, or they might even be a sort of a head of customer service or customer experience. It would be them where that makes a difference. I'm going to finish up with, uh, with quite a mundane story because one of the things we also find is that people actually forget that the database is an asset. And one of the things that you do find is if you don't put all that sort of analysis into, into practice in terms of looking at how your customers interact with you. Managing their experience, and what you find is a lot of them opt out from the communication. And over time you end up with a smaller and smaller base, which means in very simple terms, they are less re there are less of them that are reachable for marketing contact, so you can't sell as much to them. So hopefully what I've demonstrated there is a few tools in terms of how you can talk to senior execs and demonstrate the benefits of data and analysis. Um, I'll throw it open to questions, but just before I do, the answer to the, the answer to the deal book question earlier on is actually that MOAB is not the colour, the correct colour of the database, it is in fact yellow.
it already is in some cases. I think, I think Sky certainly a few years ago were publishing to the city how many customers they were acquiring because that, based on the article, that was a measure of value. So it wouldn't necessarily be a bottom line asset, but they were certainly reporting on that because the city were wise enough to see that that's how they build value. A lot of the social, you think about how companies like Twitter, Google, Facebook are valued. It's based on, it's not just based on, on what they, on profit, because none of them make profit really. It's based on their user base. And it's the potential of the user base as an advertising base. So I think, I think to a degree, it's not done formally, but it is done informally already. I'll let the chaps jump on. Thank you.